G'day folks. Well over the years we have filmed hundreds of incredibly talented people across the world. Many of these artists have gone on to produce their own videos as well. We hope you enjoy this great lesson from one of our Colour in Your Life artists. Welcome back. This is part three of a three part series, a special I've made for Graham Stevenson's Put Some Colour in Your Life channel. We're going to be getting stuck into this painting and getting it finished. I'll be doing voiceover through this. I hope you can keep up with it. I've had to fast forward a little bit through this one to squeeze it all in. You know, a painting like this usually takes a couple of days to do. So, you know, <laughs> all right, come on, let's go and have a look at it. So now I'm just lightening up that area there with a bit of a palette knife lighter tone and just wiping it back just to create some lineal texture that goes in the horizontal direction and back into my greens and I'm just going to pop a little bit of that in in the same direction running that same way to give a sense of you know the sort of rolling landscape and it just sort of breaks up because I've got a lot of just plain pale yellow there. Just back into that dark. Once again, really strengthening the greens. That's the olive green. It's like I keep going back and back to it, but it's amazing how if you build that up, it creates a really beautiful sense of texture in the paint. Even though the paint's a little bit wet, it is drying because I'm using the liquid so it's it, it it takes on a kind of a you know a texture into the ultramarine blue there just to strengthen up and darken the greens it, it also gives a little bit of a different tone to the greens otherwise if you just did it all one color you'd end up with a very flat kind of you know dull color but the colors i'm using there the olive green and the ultramarine blue are both are uh, tra fully transparent, they're 100% transparent and I really utilise the transparent colours in my painting to get this uh, sort of, this. it's like a, well, you're using the transparency to not block things out in opacity where you lose the sparkle of the canvas underneath. So just reinforcing again, just bringing it up, bringing up and all the brush strokes and everything add to the texture that you can see. Just you're still using the same, I think that's the number 12 uh, definer brush, which is a filbert brush. Filberts are fantastic. They've just got the different, you can use them on the edge to get a sharp point. You can scumble with the back of them. Uh, they're really, really great, long as you look after them. Just reinforcing the green even darker around those, those light parts. You can see now I'm just meeting the man, man's shirt. Those two colours, ultramarine blue and olive green. Oh, I go through so much olive green, I, I could use a tube in, a, in one painting. <laughs> and that is because, of course, it is, it is transparent and you do use a lot. However, I think it's a nice compromise. I love the Artist Spectrum colours. They've got so many beautiful Australian type tones and colours. They're just, they're, they're mixed uh, pigments. You know, you could read what the pigment is and you'll see what's actually in them. But it's just the convenience of having them in that tube, just like that. You can just squeeze it out and go for it. Just bringing now in a bit of the thalo green because that's actually adding yet another beautiful tone into those green bushes. Again, that's a fully transparent colour, so it all works with the same idea. Even though when I first put those darks in, they look quite dark, you can see that it's fairly light in the water. It's an extremely intuitive process. It is a process of bouncing around all over the place 
and just kind of bringing it up, just bringing it up is the only way I can really put it. I think many artists paint like that. You just have to have patience that it will work out if you just keep going. And here I'm just deciding maybe I need that to be all darker and uh, I went back and forwards on that a fair bit. If you're not watching, you know, when I'm painting in my studio, these decisions get made all the time. You know, you sort of come at that doesn't work and you undo it, you know, rub it, rubbing it off and then you put it back on again. Oh, look, I'm just going to put that blue in there, really make it sing and pop up. So now I want to get some of that really delicious Australian red gold and white to make that pop there and, and just brighten up the edge. It just gets the eye to draw into it, adding a bit of raw sienna. And just boom, just a little bit of a stroke here and there. Nice bold strokes is what you're after because that's what keeps the water looking natural and, and you know, interesting and as if it's... It is really water. So I'm just going to put a little bit more shadow into the dog, which is the ultramarine blue and my favorite, alizarin crimson, which really kicks it up. And I, I put in a bit more than you would think, and then I'd put it everywhere. So all over the painting in all the whites and it's a really good way of keeping keeping the the painting you know looking energetic and and harmonizing because you've got those colors everywhere and here I'm clearly going back into the clouds because I've gone back into the into the um, Payne's gray and well, decided to put a bit of that in the tree as well let's see just trying it on <laughs> and the dog too so just moving everywhere and you can see I didn't actually lift that brush back into any other paint. I started with the Payne's Grey and it ended up on everything. And then look, I'm back in the water, it was on the tree, it's on the dog. And I'm now going in for the uh, nice little juicy part. I've decided I've had enough of this faceless dog. And just by popping, a, a, you know, I've decided also to stop him looking like a horse, <laughs> shorten his nose a bit. But by popping in a detail like that, it just, I don't know, it makes a big difference. Sometimes I just need to do it to just get me on track, to make me feel like I, I can relate to the little people or the little critters in my paintings. And the same for the man, just a bit of a hint at it. It's not a detail. It's just a very, very short hint. And you can see with this, this is all I'm doing with the hands. It's just shadow and back into the the face flesh color, which is the alizarin crimson and the raw sienna and just bringing it up a little bit, bringing up the lights a little bit there and the same with the hand, just adding a little bit of body, keeping it very simple, just sort of following the general, you know, this is why it's good to learn how to draw because even though you're not going to be drawing absolutely realism, you actually need to know the way things move. When I was creating this little man, he's my little outback man, I created him about 35 years ago and it was just a very simple kind, he's like a meme I suppose, uh, you know, just sort of like this average guy with his big nose and who, who knows, what is an average guy these days? <laughs> but um, but he, he's stayed with me and he just sort of represents that bloke, you know, with the hat. Just I guess I ran into quite a lot of those blokes when I was in the outback on cattle stations. So for me, it makes sense. <laughs> it might be just charming for everyone else. Now I'm going for quite a dark uh, colour here. I've actually used some lizard and crimson. I want to get the shadow in the back of the boat, but I've also added in a bit of Payne's Grey to push it push it back a bit and you know I'm sort of thinking about where the light would be and I want that I want that to be clear so I'll exaggerate shadows and and transitions and things to get the effect that I want
just reinforcing isn't cadmium red just beautiful to use they just can't mimic that you know you can try using naphtol red and imitation reds but there is nothing like cadmium red they've never been able to make anything like it and uh, it's just that thing about it being a bit poisonous <laughs> it's worth it though so again you can see not doing much to those hands just tidying them up a little bit so they actually make sense they're not claws and uh, probably have a bit of a look so back into the alizarin crimson and the trans red oxide to actually create a shadow for his hat and it's starting to make him look like he makes sense simple form same in the hand and i'm just going to darken up the darks yet again for the 700th time around that hat makes him it throws your figures forward and that's what's happening here the man is sort of coming forward and here we go just sprinkling a bit of the the color everywhere. I think I'm trying to understand what I'm doing there. I'm not quite sure. And again, just moving everything across the waters just looks like a mess. I've decided to put a little bit of the sky up there because as water moves, it picks up reflections from all over the place. That you know what you see in those reflections in the water is depending on the angle of the water. Um, at that point so you know it can bend it could be facing straight up to the sky and then it would be reflecting would have white uh, sorry the uh, white clouds or the um, the blue sky just putting in a little texture here with my palette knife I've loaded it up with the Australian red gold and a bit of white to to make it sparkle a little bit it's just dying a little bit in the shadows there and that's has that has the same lovely effect of just you know bringing it up a little bit so it's it's not too plain because that that area of a bank would usually have quite a bit of detail in it because it's actually exposed so so yeah these are these are the finishing touches that are so fun to do but I don't know I think there's a lot of satisfaction only because you've actually got to do all the other parts as well And I love using palette knife like this because it gives you, it's really quite random. I mean, there is control in it, but I like how the strokes are not, you, you can't control everything. So there's, it's like controlled randomness. I can see here that I was just not quite sure what to do about that background. And so I'm just going it over everywhere, trying to bring it all together and clearly decided that I wanted more contrast right there. You know this process uh, usually goes on as I keep saying a couple of days so I would probably go and think about that overnight and look at it first thing I see it in the morning it'll I will know what to do you know it's like it stands out really clearly when you're looking at it all day you just can't see so just further blending and poking around with with the colors decided to keep going with that to bring it forward a little bit and by going back and forwards this so you see I can refine the tree so the key is here is you know don't make everything perfect on the first sweep because when you're doing the backgrounds you can you know flow through past it the tree going over the tree slightly and then you come back and it's just great it looks good because you can actually refine it afterwards I love using oil paints oh it's so wonderful I really do prefer it over acrylic if I had to choose acrylics great fun for certain things but because of the style that I'm painting in this um, you know this narrative and I, I I'm trying to capture a sort of an ethereal quality to the work and oil paint is absolutely magic at that you can use it you can do it with acrylic but it just it's just not the same it doesn't feel the same it's all about texture and malleability and stuff like that. So for me, I'd, if I had to choose, I'd go for oils. 
Now that is where I'm really trying to get a differentiation of the values to make the trees come forward as you can see. So that's taken quite a bit of work to get to that point and you can see the tree itself has uh, different subtle values which I'm just redefining with just a little bit of ultramarine blue or, or probably a few other colours mixed in there. And I, for some reason, decided I'm going to go stronger with the white. When you look at a gum tree, depending where the light is, or the sun is, it's usually got a little thin um, ray, sort of a thin band of light along, along the outside edges. Very hard to paint, but it can be done. So, you know, it's worth, worth looking, but you don't have to get everything. What you're after is drama. And, and well, that's what I'm after in my painting. I want something that actually looks, it's really beautiful to look at has a sort of almost semi-real or a surreal feeling to it. Not surrealism or, or um, photorealism, but as in, you know, just sort of, it, it just makes sense. Back in there with the twigs, that is just to refresh uh, on that, is me using a little round, it's just a watercolor round brush, a number four, and I just dip it into the terps and a little bit of a dark, some dark colors that I've got on the palette. I'm not using black, it's just a combination of the darker colours that are on the palette there and that makes a lovely little stick. And just going back with the same brush, same sort of process, dipping into the, uh, you know, into the, one of the pale whites or something that I've mixed up there and, and, you know, just putting those little highlights into the bushes and branches, it comes up really nice. And I've decided that I want to get some of the darks in there as well. It's exactly the same process. You can see to get the paint to run like that, you often just have to dip it into the, you know, a, a, a thinner medium. And it's okay, it won't be unstable, especially not when you're painting wet on wet, when all the paint's drying at the same speed. The liquid apparently does come in a very runny form, but I only use the basic one, so. And you can see there, look at the difference it makes if you go back into those dark, pieces with wet paint it it basically does the blending for you so you don't have to go over and over and over trying to blend tiny little things just trust the paint to do it for you I've decided to put some highlights on the top of those bushes to differentiate them a little bit from the background because they're just sort of blending which is kind of nice to have a little bit of that but I've mixed up a bit of sap green and white that's all it is and just you know putting some very thick bits of texture on the top there to just represent the tops of the bushes you know getting a little bit of sunlight on them and that just gives a little definition and breaks it away from the background a little bit You can also uh, do this with a palette knife as well. But if you want to have a little bit more control over the actual shapes, then you'll probably be better to use a large brush. I'm still dancing all over that canvas. <laughs> and again, look at that, just putting a little bit of white highlight into that just goes boom, it really does work. And it, it just feels like it's the right spot. I want to touch up my doggy too. He just needs to just stand out a little bit more. Now it's time to go through that refining process and, and uh, bring him forward a bit. So I'm just really reinforcing the light coming on his back. I'm sorry you can't see all of that. You'll have to trust me that that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I had so many camera angles and it was a little bit hard to sort of keep up with every move. And I'm just using, uh, I think that's a number four flat acrylic brush. 
and it's it's about the smallest brush apart from the pointed one that I use because I just can't stand using tiny brushes it just there's no point to it uh, that's a joke <laughs> but there isn't because that's not the style I'm after and you can do so much if you have good large brushes that have nice points on them um, in this case I was getting down to the wire here and wanted to get a little bit of differentiation right up close so that's about it that's about the smallest one I'll use it's actually a, a, a flat or a filbert so it's um, it's it's more like a sort of a filbert a little little bit of a bend on the end really nice brush so just putting more definition into those shadows and perhaps he needs an ear that would make sense it's all about making things make sense that doesn't mean they have to be in absolute detail they just need to make sense you know like where his hand is it needs to look like it's a hand on that angle um, and you know where his face the shadow on his face and things like that it's just that even his eye I've only put the slightest little just a little dab there just to sort of hint at what's going on there it's it's not you know a detailed eye just trying to work out whether he's smiling or being sad <laughs> being nothing and it's time for a cup of tea So now we're just getting more down to the detail and I'm, what I'm actually doing, if you could see up close, is I'm just getting rid of the little gaps that I had around his face. It, you know, even though it's an expressive painting, it just needed to be sorted out. And again, I'm just building it up, going back over and over, as you can see. That cadmium red, it's just such a beautiful colour. And, and the colour is only beautiful because of what's around it. I'm just bringing the red out into the water because that actually does happen. It's really good to just observe reflections and, you know, you see all sorts of things or, you know, get some photos and look at, blur your eyes and look at the colours. Just making sense of the boat there in the background where it, it would be hitting the light, just a hint of it and reinforcing the back of his shirt to make it a little darker. Just with some of the ultramarine blue and alizarin and crimson. So here comes a nice little spot where I put some white right at the edge of that water and a couple of little wiggly bits, not too much, where the, the light from the clouds above is probably being picked up by the water. So, you know, just a little bit. It does the job and here by reinforcing some of these crispy areas it it just makes that boat pop out so it looks a little bit cut out but it works it just makes it sit down that boat sits down I'm just trying to work out with it I put the blue on that side and I just I really didn't like that so I've decided that it just does it looks too same same so got rid of that and went back to the green and that just works beautifully, yeah. It's just a feeling thing. So that's getting very close. I feel like I have nearly got it. I love this part. I'm just gonna put a really strong highlight, just suggesting where the light is on his hand. These are the very last touches when you're really just making it stand out. I just feel like I'm nearly there. <laughs> it's just the light, light, just the white with the raw sienna and the alizarin crimson. Well, I think I'm done for now. I've just got a few little touch-ups to add on to the painting, which I'll do once it's a little bit drier. And then I'll show you what I've actually done to finish it off 
It was just took me about, I guess, oh, probably an hour to put the final touches on. So here it is. You can see I've refined a few things. I just went over and touched up the sky and the bushes and put a little bit more into the water. And I guess I crisped up everything. And, you know, I'd probably come back one more time to, to knock back some of that real tight look. So it, that's the process and that could go on for a week of, you know, bouncing back and forwards, putting it in a corner somewhere so I can stand back and look at it, you know, and pretend I'm a stranger and spin around and get surprised. Just leaving it to set is really the best way to describe it so you can get a little bit of distance from the painting. Well folks, that wraps up my three-part series on how to paint a landscape with a narrative element, this little guy in the boat with his dog. I hope you've enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun to make. And again, I'd like to thank Graham Stevenson and his crew at Put Some Colour in Your Life for inviting me to make this series and share it with you on his YouTube channel. Just a reminder, if you head to my website, you'll find there the links for the other online courses that I teach, which include a very comprehensive oil painting landscape workshop and some other really fun workshops, including some speed painting, how to loosen up with acrylics and watercolor, large format portraits of animals and watery dogs. There's quite a few different ones, uh, expressive flowers. You can find those on my website and all the connections to that. And I also hope that you'll find on my own YouTube channel, Helen Norton Art, other little videos where I do painting demos and other bits and pieces there as well. So head over there, Helen Norton Art, and also follow me on Instagram, Helen Norton Art again, and Facebook, which is Helen Norton Artist and I hope to catch up with you soon and don't forget materials and things I refer to will be down below and just drop me a note you can send me an email anytime or if you ask any questions down below I'll make sure I get onto them straight away so once again thank you all for watching and joining me through this process and I hope you have lots of happy fun painting days and constantly constantly Put some colour in your life. Bye.